So obviously from the title, we have past, present, and future. And I'm going to speak about how it all ties in together. These are three dimensions of time. Actually, right, actually before I start, I want to give a little background about this topic and why I wanted to speak about this. This actually was given about 15 years ago. And I was going through notes that I had, an old notebook of mine, and I came ac across this topic. And it was very interesting because then, 15 years ago, as what is going on now, it was very relevant and still is very relevant. And even though 15 years ago this was talking, this was the past, but even then, talking about the future and how it is applying now. And so this topic is still very relevant with what is going to happen in the future, as you will see. And this sermon was given by Mr. Edwin Pope, and so I wanted to go over this again. Nice little refresher, and in honor of him, I would like to give this. So again, this is talking about three dimensions of time, past, present, and future. So what we are to do is to look to the future, but we still need to keep the past and the present in mind. When we look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 through 30, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, we read, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And verse 30, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. As you can see, we can apply ourselves in this as we were predestined. We were called from the very beginning for a specific purpose. Even though this is referring to the past, this is still referring to what's present and what will come in the future. Perhaps we have been shown the truth through somebody else. Maybe our parents were called to the truth, and through them we were able to receive that knowledge. Some way or somehow, we became knowledgeable of the truth, and God granted us this gift now for us to use. That does not mean, though, if we have family members that were then in the church who are not now, doesn't mean we follow them out the door. No, God had a specific purpose for you and me in mind, ourselves. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Again, this is something that he had figured out long before we even knew. Because we have this understanding now, we shouldn't be ashamed of what we know now. So we learn from past mistakes. And we presently do our best so we can make it in the future. Let's look at our goal. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 14 through 16. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 14. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That prize is eternal life. 
Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Verse 16, Nevertheless, do the, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. So this is something we are presently going through that we need to continue to go through in the future. If we're continuing to move forward, we are not supposed to drift backward. We go forward with our understanding. So let us begin with the past. What should we learn from the past? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1 through 13, we read about the Old Testament examples. It's actually what the heading is called. And verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. They have all gone through it. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So as we can see here, they were all in like mind. Verse 5, But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. So, we are to learn from their mistakes. Verse 7, And do not become idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day 23,000 fell. Verse 9, Nor let us tempt or test Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by serpents nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fell, or fall. And we just heard that phrase, didn't we? That was not planned. Verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you. So none of the tests and trials that we go through, we can't handle. They are hard. Yes, they are. Except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it, bear yet, to overcome it. So all these stories that we have in the Bible and the Old Testament are examples that we are to go by, which is why they are in there. You know, they were not perfect. Not, not one man beside Jesus Christ was perfect. And many of them who will be in the kingdom went through a lot of the same tests and trials, if not worse, than what we are going through. Let's also look at Abram and Lot. In Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Genesis 13, verse 1. Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had and lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. Just from that alone, we can say that Abram was well off. He didn't need anything else, right? Verse 3, he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Lot also, verse 5, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. 
He also was rich. He also had a lot. He was in need of nothing else. So you would think. Verse 6, Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. So imagine that. (laughs) How much possession they actually had. Can't say that anybody here has that. Yet. Verse 7, And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot. Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. If you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zoar. And verse 11, Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sot. So, what was pleasing at first sight to Lot is what he chose. But is that what God wanted? So he looked at the physical rather than the spiritual. And we see in 17, chapter 17, verse 1, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. So, of course, as we know with the story, what happens on with Lot and what happens on with Abram, but this is how Lord how the Lord had presented himself to Brahm, told him to follow him. That was the number one thing. Let's look at another example in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. We will go back to that. But in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verses 9 through 11, It's a test that we are tested by God to see how we will react. And again, with what Abram and Lot had to go through, it was a test to see how they would react. And so we read here in chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. Something else that we have heard earlier, also in the sermonette. Desperately wicked, who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. As a partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by right. It will leave him in the midst of his days, and at his end he will be a fool. So going back to Genesis chapter 19, keeping that in mind, what I just read. Genesis chapter 19 and verse 1. We see where Lot chose to dwell and what is going to happen as a result. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. So then the angels are obviously coming there to warn him to leave, as we see in verse 12 of the same chapter. The men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whoever you have in the city? Take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws who had married his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But of course, to his sons-in-laws, he seemed to be joking. Why? Well, because they were so blinded by the sin of that city that they did not take him seriously. 
So in verse 15, when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife, your daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. Verse 17 came to pass, while they had brought them outside, that, that he said, Escape from your, for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to them, Please know my Lord. So as you can see, Lot kept on lingering like we read. He really, in his heart, did not want to leave. But as it got more urgent, he knew he had to do what was told. Verse 19, Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saying my life, by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. So still there was doubt, and we know there's many examples of that through others in the Bible. So we want to reason. Verse 20, See, now the city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little a little one, please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, and that I will not overthrow the city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Zor. So that was Lot's side of the story, or his example. What happened with Abraham? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 16. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in the foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child again, or a child, when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky and the multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. Verse 16, But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Faith can get you far. It goes a long way. And we also learn by example, through faith. Let's look at Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Romans chapter 4 and verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abram was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it, meaning his faith, was accounted to him for righteousness. And also in verse 13, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. 
Continuing on, for if those, verse 14, who are the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in the faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. But being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. It was a promise that he was given. It was an action that he had to take. And therefore, verse 22, it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. Again, through his example, can we learn by it? Can we apply it? It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Those, those are the past examples that we can learn from. What about presently? What are we to do now? Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 42 and 43. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and all allowed his house to be broken into. And we hear about that a lot. We are to do that. We are to watch the, current, the events that are happening around the world in light of biblical prophecy, which is why we have the updates every week, what we had heard about in the announcements, what is happening right now, what is going to affect the future. Let's also look at chapter 25. The parable of the wise and foolish virgins. So in 25, uh, chapter 25, verse 1, the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So they had God's word, and the oil is, resembles God's Holy Spirit. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, which was the darkest time, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps were going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. This was the ability to enter God's kingdom. Verse 11, Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch. Therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. These are scriptures that we constantly read. We read them all the time. But it is something that we need to apply all the time. Will we be wise and keep lamps filled with oil? Is the question. And in verse 14 through 30, the talents that we have are to be used to the best that we can do with whatever is given to us. And verse 31 through 46, through our deeds, we should show love towards others 
and that is very pleasing to God, but it also makes us better people. Well, let's also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, as to why we are to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. See how we are all there for each other. But there's something more important, or just as important, let's say, that we are to apply for ourselves individually, what we are to do presently. Another familiar scripture, we've heard many messages about it. Go to please Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18. We are to put on the whole armor of God. Verse 10, my, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. There's a lot of stuff being said here. There's a lot of things that we have to put on. But we have to put all of them on. Can't just pick one without the other. It's a lot that we have to do in order to make it. But we do have help, as we see in John chapter 6 and verse 63. John chapter 6, verse 63 It is a spirit which gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. So we are to use the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. We are not to base our lives on physicality alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. We're supposed to focus on what the Bible says. And let us not be fooled by Satan's tactics. And you can see that his tactics are awfully similar to some people in the church that we may have had contact with throughout the years presently and that we will have contact with in the future. What is it that Satan does? How did he tempt Christ in Matthew chapter 4? He questions the truth. He appeals it to human nature something that we are familiar with. He then quotes the scriptures, but puts it out of context by twisting the meaning, which adds to confusion and questioning. Sound familiar? He uses people today to do the same thing. But then again, if one doesn't understand the scripture to begin with, what do you expect? There is only one way that we can understand. Luke chapter 24 and verse 45 says that God opens our understanding that we may be able to comprehend the scriptures. Only he can call us. Only can we understand by God opening our minds. There is no way else. There's no, look at the people of this world. Why do we have hundreds and hundreds of religions out there? 
to have a different explanation of what the Bible says. Yet, even in the church, there is confusion among some. But that is something that the Bible prophesies. That is something that is happening now. It is something that will happen in the future. And as we have heard, there is still a falling away that is going to happen. And again, what is happening now? So we shouldn't be too surprised. So we're going through that presently now. And what about the future? To have success, going along with the theme of having the Spirit, it is exactly that, having God's Spirit, which we all need, to be successful. Let's look at Psalms chapter 51. Psalms chapter 51, verses 10 and 11. We can learn a lot through the life of David, what he all had to go through, and he definitely went through a lot, a lot that he had to learn, but a lot that he did learn for us. Psalms chapter 51 and verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. See how that goes together. If he didn't have the Spirit in him, he couldn't be successful. So he asks for two things. That God doesn't cast him away and also doesn't take his Spirit from him. So obviously, if God casts him away, his Holy Spirit goes with him. So that's why it is very important to have that and to use it, he needed to trust in God insofar as his future was concerned. More than often, the future is based on trust, putting our trust and confidence into something now, that it will come to fruition in the future. I trust that God will protect me. Also in the future. Yes, you can ask that presently, or let's say, I trust that you will give me what I'm owed. I trust that you'll pay me back. Something that's going to talk about in the future. I trust that I will make it to work safely. Something that will still occur in the future. But it is I trust and faith that we have to have now. So our future will be impacted negatively. Let's look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. Our calling is a mystery to the world. Some that may believe it or think they are called are clearly not called, but that's what it is. How is it that we are called and others are not? How is it that we can understand that and others do not? Verse 25, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, and it is written, The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And that can only happen because of repentance. God is the one who has to call us, as I had already said, which he has at this time. Hopefully, right? Those of us who are sitting here, who are listening, who are to this message, can we ask that question? Has God in fact called us? Do we believe that we are doing the right thing? That we know the truth? See, the rest of the world will get their chance, and Israel will be saved due to their repentance. But there are still plenty of warnings in the Bible what will happen to those who do not obey. And that's still a, a lot of this is still a future prophecy. 
But still, what happened in the past will again happen in the future. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. That's still something that will happen in the future. And I'll still go into that. And also in verse 25, in the same chapter, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. You shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. It's still prophesied to happen. Happened then, it will happen again. Also look at Micah. And in chapter 5, Micah chapter 5, verses 10 through 15. Talking about the future. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from your midst, destroy your chariots, cut off the cities of your land, throw down all your strongholds. I will cut off sorcerers, sorceries from your hand. You shall have no soothsayers. Your carved images I will also cut off, your sacred pillars from your midst. You shall no more worship the work of your hands. I will pluck your wooden images from your midst. Thus I will destroy your cities, and I will execute vengeance in anger and fury on the nations that have not heard. Those nations are the nations that we live in. At least we're here referring to the US, Great Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. This is a future prophecy of what will happen to these nations. Why? Let's notice Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. Why would God be so angry? You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way, in the multitude of your mighty men. Therefore, tumult shall arise among your people, and all your fortresses shall be plundered. As Shalman plundered Beth, Arbel in the day of battle, a mother dashed in pieces upon her children, Thus it shall be done to you, O Bethel, because of your great wickedness at dawn the king of Israel shall be cut off utterly. So really what will happen in the future are new things to come about. God wants to make things new. And a new covenant with Israel will be made. Notice Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 8 through 10. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their people, and they shall be my people. Not saying that he's making a new law, the law still is applied. But a new covenant with Israel will be made. Positivity, a positive change in the future 
is also going to come about in Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 13 through 17. Verse 13, all your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you, you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the spoiler to destroy. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue which arises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. And also in chapter 60 and verse 18, Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. And in verse 21 of the same chapter, Also your people shall be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planning, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. Verse 22, a little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. And that time is not here yet. This is talking about a future time. And we do not know what that time is. But we can have an idea of a timeline, because we are to continue to watch. In the meantime, God has appointed certain people for a job to do to help us all, to teach and to spread the word on what is coming. Notice Ephesians chapter 4. And again, this is God's doing. This is what he had in mind. This was the purpose from the beginning. We may have never asked for it, but we have to respect it and we have to do it. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Starting, we read, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of a son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of a doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. We are all working together for something better. We all have our individual skills, our individual talents, and we all have a certain part to do in the church. Putting those all together brings about a unity. And that is what we have all been called to do. But with that come a lot of tests and trials because we need to be vigilant and we need to be strong and we need to be aware of the warnings explained in the Bible, what has been happening presently and what is going to happen in the future. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and starting in verse 4.
Jesus saying here, Take heed that no one deceives you. We heard about this in the first message. Heard about this in the announcements. We will continue to hear about this because this is a very important warning. And it is very easy to be deceived, which is why we need to be careful. Verse 5, many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. There are false prophets. There are people who think they know the truth, but do not. They may be convincing, but they are not. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So if there's a little problem in our lives, or putting out in a broader spectrum here. Are we going to run away from that problem? Verse 7, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So any problems that we may be going through, you can kind of compare it in that same way. It's just the beginning. Verse 9, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Here's that falling away that we have heard about, which is still going to happen. Offense. It's very easy to be offended, right? Even Christ was offended. Or, I mean, people were offended by what Christ said. That's what I mean. But how did he react? I mean, when Judas did what he did, still Christ called him friend. You know, how, how many of us can do that when we are offended by somebody? I think we are. So verse 11, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Yes, it's still going to happen. Verse 12, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And this is not talking about people in the world. This is talking about God's people. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So even though we are called right now and we have received the Holy Spirit, we're not at the end yet. That doesn't mean we can be affected. Verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, which we are doing now, presently, for the sake of the future, because then the end will come. The end is something we all look forward to because all things will be made new. And notice Revelation chapter 21 for the final scripture. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8, a scripture I believe no one gets tired of reading because it is a great foretaste of what we can look forward to. Verse 21 of Revelation, Now I saw a new heaven, and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Verse 7, he who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. 
But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. A category we do not want to be part of. But to emphasize, verse 7, he who overcomes until the end shall inherit all things. And that is hopefully something that we can accomplish, that we still need to go through. So, we can see how the past and the present and the future all work together. How the Bible shares with us experiences that even the most faithful had to go through for our admonition. The Bible shows us how we are to apply in our present lives the Word of God by obeying Him so we can then experience what the future indeed has in store for us. Thank you.